Oh, okay. And can you go hit the button on the, the, the power switch up there? I think I test. Yeah, I forgot to cut it on. Thank you, buddy. Uh, John 19. Now, we finished up 18 on Wednesday night, and uh, we're on 19 tonight. John 19. Okay, John 19, we're going to begin here. Uh, but first, let's, let's recap a little bit from chapter 18. Um, one thing that we know is Jesus said this in verse 36 of John 18. He says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm or of this world. Now consider this for a second, the significance of this point. If Jesus' kingdom is not of this realm, if it's not of this world, if it's not a physical thing, then why would Jesus, why would his coming in his kingdom be a physical thing? Why would the coming of the king be a physical thing if his kingdom doesn't have anything to do with the physical things of this world? Why would him sitting on a throne be a physical thing? Why would the temple in the middle of this kingdom be a physical thing? Why would the new heavens and new earth, uh, you know, in which he reigns, be a physical thing if Jesus' kingdom is not of this realm? Jesus is telling us here that the focus of the new covenant and his reign is a spiritual focus and not a physical focus. People who look for a physical reign in Jerusalem sometime in our future, you know, they've been very excited about that since the uh, embassies moved to Jerusalem. Um, they, they're looking in the wrong place. They're looking down here for the kingdom of God when they should be looking in the world above, and, and that is in the spiritual sense, looking for the kingdom of God. You might remember how in Luke chapter 17, the Pharisees had a question for Jesus concerning his kingdom. In Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, the Pharisees ask Jesus this. Uh, the scripture says, Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered and said, the kingdom, of, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst or is among you. Uh, so Jesus' point again here is, you're not going to see a big army trampling around the countryside. You're not going to see a brick-and-mortar building where you know, a palace is going to be. You're not going to see me in a, in a scarlet robe or what, what have you. You know, sitting on a mighty throne in Jerusalem. That's not what you're going to see. The kingdom of God is a spiritual thing. It's not something that can be looked at with the eyes. Now, let's hold on to that point for just a second. The kingdom of God is not coming with, with, with signs that can be observed. In other words, it's not going to have a palace. It's not going to have an army, things like that, that you can lay your eyes on and see and obviously tell this is the kingdom of God. But look at the language of Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. Look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. We're very familiar with this verse, but there's a three-letter word here that seems to go against what Jesus said in Luke 17. And here's what he says. Mark 9, 1, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here. Now notice he says some, not all. Uh, it's not a very good prophecy. You know, he's, not, he's not saying all of you will be around when the kingdom comes on Pentecost. That's not what he's saying. He's saying some of you. Now, if I say some of you, that's obvious that it's not going to be all of you. Well, none of Jesus' apostles were killed prior to the day of Pentecost. The persecution against the church didn't start until um, you know, after Jesus' resurrection with Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So he says some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's come with power. So here you have apparently two contradictory statements. You have seeing the kingdom of God come with power. And over here in Luke 17 it says, the kingdom of God does not come with signs to be observed. So how would they see the kingdom of God coming with power without seeing it? Solve the riddle. Uh, Ashley says in the mind. Uh, in other words, Ashley says that the things that they, uh, they, 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 knew that they knew God's timeline. They were familiar with God's scheme of redemption. Jesus had taught that to them. And whenever they would see these things happening uh, in their world, 
that would be evidence that the kingdom of God had come. And that's exactly right. You know, this is exactly what we talked about. Uh, by the way, you can be flipping back to John uh, 19 now. That's exactly what we talked about in John 14 through 16. We spent so much time in there where the scripture said that you are, uh, you're going to see me, but the world is not going, to, not going to see me. And, you know, Judas in particular was confused about that. He says, well, how can we see you, but the world not see you? How can you manifest yourself to us, but not to them? Because it's a spiritual thing. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a heavenly thing, not a physical thing. In order for one to, to see spiritual things take place, there has to be, you know, the, the opening of the eyes, as it was with, uh, was it Elijah or Elisha and his servant? When they were in the valley and they saw all the, uh, was it the chariots of fire? You know, and the point was, we're not alone here. God is with us. So you can't see a, a spiritual thing with your eyes unless your eyes are opened up in some way. Another way that you can see a spiritual thing with your eyes is by not seeing it directly, but by seeing a representation of it. So Jesus dies on the cross. He he's, he's comes out of the tomb the third day, and he ascends into heaven. And we've labored you know, very hard to show how those were physical events that pointed to a spiritual reality. Here is Jesus' defeat of death, defeat of Hades, and here is his ascension to the right hand of God. All those are spiritual ideas, but they're represented by physical actions. Another thing that we've talked about is baptism. Whenever, you know, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 that baptism is the work of God. Whenever you're baptized, that's a, that's a physical action that we can behold with our eyes. But we know that there's nothing special about the water that does anything at all. But it's what is represented in that action. And that is your death to your old self your uh, burial with Christ and your resurrection with him, as uh, several scriptures uh, point out. And so there is, again, a physical thing. See, I, you don't see somebody becoming a new creation. You don't see somebody becoming a new man. You can't see sins being washed away off in the water. Now we have to drain the baptistry to get all the sins out of there. But it's a, it's a physical action that points to a greater spiritual reality that's taking place. And that's why so many people are hung up on baptism. Because they think, oh, it's a physical thing. We don't need any physical things. We don't need any rituals. Why are you doing these rituals? This is Jewish stuff. No, it's, it's what it represents. The Jewish washings, as we talked about last week, were for the sanctification and purification of the flesh. But the baptism of, uh, the, baptism of the Great Commission is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. As 1 Peter 3.21 says, doesn't have anything to do with the flesh. It's a physical action that we submit ourselves to. It's not something that we do, but we completely submit ourselves to it, uh, and it, it represents a spiritual transformation that's going on in our lives uh, you know, through the gospel of Christ. So just a side note there, pretty big side note, but it's, it's, it's uh, relevant. And now here we are in John chapter 19. Does anybody have any questions or comments up to this point? Okay. So this is after Pilate has found Jesus innocent. He tried to get Jesus released, but they would not have it. You know, they shout, crucify him, crucify him. And they have uh, Barabbas let go instead of Jesus. And so then, 19.1, uh, Pilate then took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple or a scarlet uh, robe on him. And they began to come up to him and say, Hell, King of the Jews, and to give him slaps in the face. Now Jesus had just said, My kingdom is not of this world. And they're mocking this idea. See, to these soldiers' mind, what good is there in a kingdom that doesn't produce earthly, worldly riches? What good is it? Ashley? Uh, on verse 1, where it says Pilate flogged him, did Pilate actually physically flog him, or is that like saying he gave the consent for him to be flogged? Because I'm just interested in the fact that, you know, he, did, he was like really didn't want to cross him, but did he, did he turn around and flog him? Um, okay, so the, there's an alternate translation here that could be, and that is he had him scourged. Yeah. 
or he had him flogged. So uh, the reason why it's translated he scourged him here is because it's in the it's in the active voice, uh, and so he's you know it's not necessarily stated like that. But that is a that is a possible translation. He had him scourged, uh, you know, just so it could be. But the thing about it is, is Pilate here is succumbing to the pressure of the Jews, and all the actions from here on out is him. So coming to the pressure of the Jews, despite knowing that he's that Jesus is innocent, and so this truly is a very sad uh, situation that Pilate would, you know, would give in like he has, even knowing that Barabbas was guilty and Jesus was innocent, he still was willing to to listen to what the Jews said, and uh, this is the type of relationship that we see between Rome and and Judea uh, for years and years and years. And this is what led to the persecution of the church in the first century. Um, and, you know, this is the harlot-beast relationship of Revelation 19. You know, the harlot rides that scarlet beast. And uh, the, that beast eventually turns on the harlot and burns her and destroys her, right? And so you have this harlot-beast relationship, Jerusalem and Rome, working together in the first century to attempt to bring about the end of the uh, church, and obviously they were ultimately unsuccessful. One of the reasons why, my kingdom's not of this world. Um, as long as the gospel of Christ uh, exists, you know, then the ability to plant that seed and to produce children of the kingdom is, you know, uh, always available. So Pilate, Pilate had Jesus scourged, regardless of whether or not he did that or he had somebody do that for him. He, uh, he had him scourged. And the soldiers, they put this crown of thorns on his head and this purple robe on him, and they're mocking his position as the king of the Jews. Now, he really was the king of the Jews, but not in the way that these soldiers perceived, or at least not in a way that they thought was uh, worthy of anything. You know, to them, that's like... You know, it's like you know, a child saying, I'm king of my imaginary made-up world. Okay, what good does that do? And that's how they're viewing Jesus, and so they're mocking him in this way. Now, here Pilate is again. Oh, uh, Lonnie, did you have something? No. Oh, see, when that, when that, when that hand goes up, I always think something's uh, coming, coming around. So, uh, verse, verse 4. Uh, so Pilate comes out again. And said to him, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And so, after having him scourged and delivering him to the soldiers to you know, be, uh, be sorely disrespected, Pilate still is trying to get Jesus off the hook. He says, I found no guilt in him. And, you know, as we... Um, what did Pilate fam- famously do in order to demonstrate that he found no guilt in Jesus? He washed his hands of the matter. That's kind of like whenever you know you, you know when, when you have a when you have a uh, a kid. We have kids, you know, at uh, church camp where they go off this rope swing, and this is like telling them this rope swing is all tattered. We don't trust it. Don't do it. I said, but I want to do it. He climbs up and goes off the rope swing. Well, you say before he does that, okay, I'm washing my hands of this. You know, if you get hurt, that's on you. Now you might think that that was a pretty liberal approach but you know when you have nine brothers and sisters you just you, they, sometimes they have to get hurt to be taught us <laughs> so they go off this rope swing and you say okay you go but I've told you not to do it and then they come crying you know later and they say why did we why'd you let us do that well this is what Pilate's doing I don't have I haven't found any guilt in him he's innocent just letting you know that and so Jesus comes out in verse 5 wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now that's a a really good three words there if you take it out of context. Kind of like when, uh, was it Nathan talking to David? Was it Nathan? And he said, Thou art the man. I always thought, you know, you're the man. Well, here he says, Behold the man. And that is the man that you want crucified. And here he is with the, he's, you know, bleeding down his face. He's been scourged on his back. All the flesh, you know, being ripped off his back from that vile uh, treatment. He's been slapped. He's been ridiculed and humiliated. And here he is, behold the man. 
So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Again, urging the Jews, He's not guilty. You do this. You take him and put him to death. I'm not, I don't want anything to do with this. The Jews, the Jews answered him, We have a law. And by that law, okay, uh, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. We'll pause there. And Zelda, did you have? Yeah, I was just going to say that since Pilate didn't find anything to crucify him with, why would they overstep Pilate? Well, I mean, to me, I just, I did, I'm, I'm like, if he didn't find anything, he's the one of the high, and he's the high priest, whatever. He, he's the governor, something, right? Uh, Pilate is? Uh, yeah, Pilate would be more. Right. Why would they want to take and crucify him if he didn't find no charges against him? Well, they, okay, they're overstepping their boundaries because of their hatred for, for Jesus. Um, and, you know, at some time, sometimes they'd respect their boundaries, like in John 11. You know, we, uh, we don't want to do anything to upset the Romans. We need to get rid of this man. Um, but here we're really showing, you know, it's, it's really being shown who is in charge in the first century. Uh, go to, let's see, go to Revelation chapter 17 for a moment. Because this, that's a very insightful question. Because you think, well, the, you know, well, the, uh, the Jews, you know, they're, I mean, not the Jews, but the, the Romans, I mean, they're the boss in town. Look at, look at Revelation 17 and verse 18. Notice what he says here. Revelation 17, 18. The woman whom you saw is the great city. Now, that's, just to clarify, that's the harlot. That's Jerusalem. That's Old Covenant Israel. The woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. They were, they were, they were in charge. Now, they were using Rome and abusing their relationship with Rome. Rome had given them a lot of slack, allowing them to, to have their own priesthood and things like that uh, and not, not have to bow down to, uh, to uh, let's see, what's that called? Polytheism. They didn't have to worship any Roman gods or anything like that. Uh, and they've been given a lot of slack. And they were abusing that slack. You know, just like if you give a kid slack and you allow him to get away with anything, well, he's going to end up gonna abusing that, you know, abusing that relationship because he sees weakness there. And so the Jews were doing the same thing. Here they have Pilate. He's easily persuaded. And so they're pressuring him, pressuring him, pressuring him, knowing that he wants just peace in his province. You know, he just wants peace over the people that he's ruling over. And so he's not going to try to do anything to upset the multitude of people. And so they're taking advantage of that is what you have. Truly, the, the woman did uh, reign over the kings of the earth. Any more thoughts on that? When I look at this, I, it just made me think about, you know, um, when you see crowds of people gather, you know, right. you might have a group, a select group that really fired up about the cause, but then you have other people that kind of get sucked into it, you know, and we have to be really careful about what we, because, you know, someone can present something that sounds like a noble thing or whatever, you know, before you know it, it, it went left and all kinds of nonsense is going on that you had no intention of being a part of. I'm sure it's probably some people in that crowd that might not have initially went there for it to go that way, but before you know it, you, you can find yourself sucked up into all of that. Right, so uh, Ashley points out that, you know, when you're in a crowd of people like that and the majority is chanting and, you know, rooting for one thing, sometimes you, you might start off kind of in agreement with everyone, but then it gets to a, just a crazy point where everybody goes into insanity. And she suggests this might be kind of what's happened here in, uh, in John chapter 19, that some of these people didn't necessarily agree with what was going on, but they got caught up in it by peer pressure and stuff like that, wanted to fit in, and so they... They fell in line with their leaders, the chief priests uh, and chief officers, etc. That's, that's talked about here. Okay, that's a very good question, uh, Zelda. All right, uh, let's see. Verse 7, John 19. So the Jews answered him. So Pilate says he's not guilty. The Jews say, uh, we have a law, 
And by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. Now, uh, what they're arguing here is, is that Jesus is speaking evil against God by saying that he is uh, the son of God. Look, this, this comes from, by the way, uh, Leviticus 24, 16. Leviticus 24, 16 is one of the places that this, uh, this could come from, this, this uh, thing that they're talking about. Leviticus 24, 16 says, Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregations shall certainly stone him. The alien as well as the native, and when he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. So here is a potential passage that they're drawing off of. See, do you remember back in uh, John chapter 18, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe that was over there in Matthew 26 that we looked at a while ago. But whenever, yeah, it was definitely Matthew 26. Let's, let's go back to Matthew 26 for a moment. The, the main charge that they're bringing against Jesus is that of blaspheming the name of God. In Matthew 26, we have Jesus before uh, Caiaphas or Caiaphas. And in, it says here in verse 63 and 64, and following, So Jesus keeps silent, Matthew 23, 63. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are Christ, the Son of God. And he goes on and he says, You said it yourself, nevertheless I tell you, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. So that's why they're, they're trying to go for death here. Because Jesus did claim to be the Son of God. And he was the Son of God, obviously. Uh, and they counted that as blaspheming the name of God. How dare a man, in other words, from Nazareth, uh, you know, dare say that he is equal with God. That he is God's Son. Uh, they saw that to be just just an awful idea, especially now that he's been beaten, bruised, and uh, you know put up before them in such a shameful way. Not to mention that their expectations of what the Messiah would do would be to you know completely take back over Jerusalem from uh, you know from Rome and to be a king on an, on an earthly king uh, in an earthly kingdom. And so this whole idea that Jesus has presented to them that his kingdom is not of this earth and things like that completely go against all their expectations, and so they want him gone. Now notice, they're asking for a death penalty that actually goes against the very law that they're citing. Because what did the law in Leviticus say ought to happen to him? Not that he'd be crucified, but that he'd do what? Stone. Be stoned. That's right. And so they were more than willing to stone that woman who was caught in adultery. Do you remember that? And now they're not going to stone Jesus. They're, instead, they're going to have Rome put him, uh, put him to death. Now, why do you think that is? Now, I know it's to fulfill prophecy. We've read that before. Uh, you know, this they did in order to fulfill, you know, what Jesus had earlier said about what manner he would die. He'd be lifted up from the earth. But why do you think that they were pressing for crucifixion instead of stoning. Well, that's that that's true. It really was an, ag an agonizing death. That's right. Uh, there's a couple things. One, number one, they weren't supposed to be able to kill. They weren't supposed to kill anybody. And number two, is that's that was considered considered what do you call it? A, a bad way to die. I can't think of it. Right, like right. So, so one. Oh, keep going. Right, right. So Lonnie says one that uh, you know, they they didn't have the authority to kill him, um, being under being under Roman rule. And second, again, that's a, just a terrible way to die. So they're pushing for this. Let me offer. A, does anybody else have any theories on that? So they can blame the Romans, and I think Gary has nailed it on the head. Now that whole the whole of the things you mention is uh, obviously you know intriguing, but the Jewish leaders uh, knew that Jesus had a ton of followers, 
I mean, here he is drawing crowds, you know, upwards of 5,000, you know, and 7,000, right? And so he has all these crowds that are following around everywhere, multitudes and multitudes. Um, if you do something that your people that, that you rule over don't like, what are they going to do to you? Right. And so now they're trying to entrap him by saying that he's blasphemed, and they're going to have the Romans put him to death. I think this is really interesting. And this is, a, this is a point that we've known, but I think we could take this even deeper. Do you remember uh, in Acts chapter 2, we're going we're gonna to look at a couple of these statements. But you remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 36, where Peter tells the Jews, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He says, you are the ones that have crucified Jesus. And didn't he say earlier that you have with wicked hands? Right? Look at verse uh, 22 and 23. Scripture says here, Acts 2, 22, 23. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross uh, by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Notice, you nailed him to the cross by the hands of godless men. So it was the Jews working through the Romans to nail Jesus to the cross. Now, I think I've given this illustration before, but whenever a, uh, whenever a baseball player hits a home run, who gets the... Who gets the home run on their stats, the baseball player or the bat? The player, right? The bat, you know, he's just a tool that the player's using to get that home run. Okay, same thing with the Jews and the Romans. The Jews, like a baseball player, uses a bat, used and took advantage of the Romans in order to put Jesus on the cross. So it says here, you have crucified him. That's who the charge, that's, that's who uh, the charge is given to. Let's look at Acts chapter 3 now. I want to look at a couple of these points. Acts chapter 3. Excuse me. Um, Acts chapter 3 verse 14 and 15 says this. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death, that's you, you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, uh, a fact to which we're witnesses. Um, even he says in verse 13, again, it's, it's the one who you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate. It's even found in chapter 4 as well. Go look at that at Acts chapter 4. Uh, and look at verse 10 and 11. 10 and 11 of Acts chapter 4. He says again, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders which became the chief cornerstone. Now, what would this, what, what would this chief cornerstone do to the ones that rejected him? It would crush him. It would destroy him. That's right. Of course, this, uh, this cornerstone passage comes from uh, Psalm 118. Whoever would fall on the stone would be broken. Whoever the stone would fall on, it would crush him. Okay, so he's telling them, you're going to be judged. You're going to be crushed because you are guilty of crucifying Jesus. Now, we could go to several other passages um, in the book of Acts. And take a look at these pronouns, you, 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 you. In fact, it switches eventually. Whenever they get out of Jerusalem and they're preaching to the most parts of the world, they start going, they crucify Jesus, they crucify Jesus, they. He doesn't continue, you, you, you. Because it was those in Jerusalem that were, you know, as Jesus says, it cannot be that a prophet perish outside of Jerusalem. So it was the city of Jerusalem that was primarily guilty for the sin. Now look at Revelation 1-7. And... I've, we, we know what this verse means, but I think what John is doing here is he's intentionally 
playing to the uh, he's playing to the to the to the weakness of the Jews and their inability to accept the fact that they were the ones who crucified the Messiah. To to basically, you know, uh, shame them because they made the Romans do it. Let me let me read it for you. Revelation one seven. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Now we know the ones who pierced him, physically pierced him, were the, was Romans. And everybody knows that. You can read about that in John 19 as we're about to do, uh, maybe not in this class, but the next. Um, but everybody knows that it was the Roman soldiers that pierced Jesus. One famous preacher in the church you know, says when Jesus was, was suspended between the two twilights of life and death, the heathen Roman Gentile soldier reached up with a spear and pierced the side and forthwith came out blood and water. And he says, and now these two elements, blood and water, are forever enjoined in the pools of baptism. I, I just know that because it was such an eloquent way that he always said that. I've listened to that lesson a couple times. But uh, the point being, we all know it was the Roman soldiers that, that, that pierced Jesus. But what is he telling them here? He's telling him it's not the wrong, it's not Rome that did it. The ones that were guilty of the piercing of Jesus, as we read about in Acts two, Acts three, and Acts four, were the leaders and inhabitants of Jerusalem that yelled, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Uh, on that morning of Jesus' trial. Lonnie, yeah, because uh, they use the word and they that pierce the side. What one man that pierced? That's. That's a good point. I've never thought about that before. It was only one man that did it, but it's they. That's sharp. I've never, I've never thought about that before. That's exactly right. Uh, Lonnie says, it's they, not he that pierced his side, but they. Multiple, in other words, multiple people pierced him, but only one physically pierced him. And, of course, we know why this is. We can go to Zechariah 12.10 uh, and see that it was the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem that were that were the ones who pierced him. So that was a good point, Lonnie. I'm gonna have to put that one into uh, put that one into the memory bank. If you listen closely to this weekend, I might even mention that if I think about it. Uh, Zelda. But don't you um, can't you use as the people that physically pierced him? Can't you use them as well as the people that pierced him all over again? I uh, I think you're referring to Hebrews chapter six, right? Hebrews chapter 6. Now, I, I, I do think that Hebrews 6, verse 6, actually. Um, that is a good idea. But we need to keep... So, so two things. Uh, Zelda says that the ones who pierced him, you know, in a sense, when we sin, we pierce Jesus all over again. And that is true. Um, but specifically in Revelation, we've got to keep in mind that's specifically talking about the Jews. But that is a good secondary application. Uh, Hebrews 6, 6, Scripture says here, that those who've fallen away, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put them to an open shame. And uh, it's talking about people that willfully sin even after having tasted of the ages to come through the power of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that you can't uh, you know, repent and turn back to God if you fall away. That's talking about a specific people, specific time. But the point does stand. If we think about Every time we sin, if we take our mind back to the cross, and remember that's why Jesus died for, well, that's what Jesus died for. Our sins put him there, the sins of all of humanity of all time, put Jesus on that cross, then we can think of it in that way. It's a very humbling thought that you know Jesus died for you. Paul was very personal in Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. Now, he loved the whole world, John three sixteen, But Paul says he loved me. He, he died for us as individuals. Uh, you know, he, he died so that every single person can have the opportunity of the forgiveness of sins. So, uh, taking this back to John 19 now, we have a pretty good understanding of... Who's guilty of the blood of Christ? Um, the Romans obviously are not in the right here, uh, but they're not the main. Uh, they're not the main ones who are guilty of the blood of Christ. It is the Jews in Jerusalem that rejected Jesus and yelled, "Crucify him! Crucify him!" Uh, they're the ones who are guilty of all this. 
Now, Pilate is very struck by this idea that Jesus could possibly be the Messiah, uh, the Son of God. Now, when Pilate, this is verse 8 of John 19. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. The part about him being a king over a heavenly kingdom had him, you know, already kind of uneasy about this whole situation. But now that he might even be the son of God, now he's even more afraid. Therefore, when Pilate heard that statement, he was more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Now, do you remember how Jesus answered that before, uh, throughout the book of John? I am from above, you are from beneath, I am not of this world, you are of this world. And so he's asking, where are you from? But Jesus isn't going to give his defense. He, as a, as a, uh, as a lamb before the shears, he did not open up his mouth. To loosely quote that passage from Isaiah 53. Okay, so he says this in verse 10. You do not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you? And I have authority to crucify you? Now this is important. The authority still lied with Pilate. It didn't matter what the Jews said. He had the authority to let him go, but he's let that pressure get to him. Right. He allowed the people to override his own uh, his own decision. Uh, Lonnie, I think I think it was probably going on at that time because if if the uh, person there couldn't keep the people under control, you know, Right, so if, so if Pilate, Lonnie is saying, if Pilate would have, uh, it would have let these people go crazy, then he would have lost his power that he had and possibly been moved somewhere else, but he wanted to keep his power, keep his authority. Now Jesus says this, and this is brilliant. You would have no authority over me, you would have no authority over me unless it's been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Again, demonstrating the point the, 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 uh, the Romans were a baseball bat and the Jews were a hitter. And they're about to knock out this seemingly home run, but it's going to knock off the rafters and fall back into the infield three days later <laughs> whenever Jesus is raised from the dead. Now let's, let's hold on to this idea for a second. You have no authority over me unless it's been given to you from above. Go back in your Bible to the book of Daniel chapter 2. This is a good reference for that. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 21. Daniel 2, 21. It is he who changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to them, uh, to the men of understanding. Now this is just a general statement by Daniel about the nature of God and how he acts in the world. He changes times and seasons. Now, that could be uh, not like we think times and seasons, uh, but that actually could be. It's The word in my Bible is epochs, but I just went ahead and said seasons since I know that's what most of your Bibles have. Um, that phrase times and epochs, times and seasons, is used at least two times in the New Testament. You might want to write this down or go study it. Uh, it's used in 2 Thessalonians. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. And it's also used in Acts chapter 1, uh, let's see, in verse 7. So maybe you want to go check that out. Maybe you find something interesting, correlation between these two texts. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, and then Acts 2, 7. Uh, But anyways, here's the point. God removes kings, he establishes kings. The, The point being... You don't have any authority at all except to be given to you from above. Now, we get so concerned about how things are going in our world today. And uh, yes, God removes kings and sets up kings. He does that in some countries through, you know, through uh, votes. Okay. Is that me or is that? My, my thing came off. Okay. 
Um, but the point is, is that God's in control. And so even when things look their grimmest, uh, remember that God did work through people such as Alexander the Great, such as Nero, Caesar, uh, you know, and, and these other people who we, we wouldn't look, you know, speak too highly of because of the, you know, war atrocities that they committed from time to time. But all that aside, all that aside, God is in control. And so at the end of the day, whenever we get nervous or fr- afraid about how things are going in the world, first off, keep in mind that this world is not our home. But also keep in mind that God is in control, uh, you know, when it's all said and done. And so we should put our total faith in him and uh, not get too stressed out. Not saying that we shouldn't be worried, but, you know, not get too stressed out when things seem to be going south. Because, you know, uh, like I mentioned before, we need to put our total faith in God. Okay. John nineteen eleven again, he says, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. Now, this also plays into what we read in Acts 2 a while ago, that Jesus was delivered by the predetermined counsel of God. Pilate was put there in the strangest reason, in ways that we can't even comprehend, or reasons for that we can't even comprehend. Pilate was put there because God knew that he would be the type of man that would allow this crucifixion to take place in order for the plan of God to be seen. Remember, Jesus was delivered by the predetermined council, is what Acts chapter 2 says. He was slain from the foundation of the earth, as uh, the book of Revelation says. And so it could be that what Jesus is saying in a sort of a, in sort of a secondary way, you've been put here for this specific reason because God knows your heart, and he knows that you're going to turn me over to the Jews to be crucified. And so through you, you know, God's wonderful plan is going to work out. But Jesus is just telling him, you say you have authority. The only reason you have it is because God let you be in this position. So, uh, Lana. That's part of that. That's a, he that delivered me unto thee had the greater sin. Right, the Jews did, right? Notice it doesn't say Pilate was sinless. It just says that he had the greater sin. As a result of this, verse 12, we're getting near the end, I think. Yeah. Uh, Ashley. That greater sin thing. You know All right. right. I know exactly where you're going. Okay, so somebody that want to try to be, you know, want to pick stuff apart and try to use things to justify and say, oh, you know, this sin is greater than that one. You know, if I sip a piece of gum, that's not as bad as if, you know, John go and kill somebody or whatever. How, how would you explain right? Okay. Um, I think that what we need to keep in mind here is the covenantal relationship that the Jews had with God versus the one that Pilate had with God, which was non-existent. Um, and so, what you have here 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 these are these are Jews who should know better, and yet they don't know better. Okay. And here's Pilate who doesn't really know any better. He doesn't know the. Excuse me. Excuse me. He's not under the old covenant. He knows that Jesus is innocent, but, you know, he's not really sure, you know, what to think. Um, Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. I don't think that the greater sin here is due to, uh, you know, because they're both committing the same sin, crucifying an innocent man. But it has more to do with that person's prior knowledge and how they should behave uh, and not the acts that they committed. I look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 through 22. For if after they have escaped the the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. Now this is obviously talking about Christians, but we could go to another passage about the many stripes and see the same idea. Those who know to do good and you don't do it, that's different than someone not knowing what the good thing to do is and uh, not doing it. And so that's, that's the basic idea. Uh, he, he goes on to say, verse 21, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. It's happened to them according to a true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to the wallowing in the mire. So here the Jews are wallowing in the mire, the greater sin, versus Pilate who 
only has a second-hand familiarity with the Old Covenant and isn't even a member of the Old Covenant uh, community at all. 